Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this recommended Silicon video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with the next generation Xbox, codenamed Scarlet. You may be aware that Phil Spencer has confirmed that there are multiple next generation Xboxes being launched, although details as to what those will be are still thin on the ground. A commonly held belief is that Sony will launch the PlayStation 5, which according to rumours will be powered by both Navi from AMD's GPU division, as well as Zen from of course the CPU lineup, ahead of the next generation Xbox, but according to industry analyst Michael Pachter, this is not the case. He has recently gone on record and said that he believes, according to his sources and what he thinks is going on at Microsoft, that they will indeed launch the next generation Xbox ahead of the PlayStation 5. Here's what he had to say. I'm sure Microsoft intends to launch first, and I'm equally certain that the next Xbox will be backwardly compatible with any Xbox One X software. I agree that it's hard for Xbox One purchasers, but they should know four years into the cycle that there's another one coming. My guess is that Microsoft intends to launch in 2020, but if they think Sony is going to launch the PlayStation 5, then then they will launch early. As for the reasons behind all of this, well, they're pretty darn simple. Microsoft don't want Sony to get a drop on them with the next console generation. They, of course, want to be ahead of the curve. Now, for Microsoft, there are a couple of interesting scenarios here. The first is that the next generation PlayStation, as I just mentioned, will be using Navi. From what the rumours are on how much validity you want to put into them, how much stock you want to put into them, well, that's down to you. Navi was primarily designed for the next generation PlayStation. Therefore, do Sony have some type of exclusivity there in terms of the GPU? If not, well, that's going to be kind of weird. After all, uh, Sony supposedly put some dollars behind the development of Navi. And if they do, what boat will that leave Microsoft in? Will they use yet another derivative of Vega? Or will they use this so-called next generation GPU? Or will AMD and Microsoft simply tweak Navi enough where it's no longer quite the same architecture to get around any legal issues? After all, in reality, Microsoft and Sony, if they are still going with AMD, and the good money is that they will, if only for backwards compatibility sake, there are only a certain amount of products in AMD's lineup which would make sense for the next generation Xbox. Speaking of the next generation and graphics horsepower, there was also a rather interesting statement from one of AMD's employees. I forgot a name, I'll try to remember to plonk it on the video uh, on screen. But just recently he went on record and said that he believes that for 30 FPS uh, 4K, you will need at least 7.4 teflops of GPU performance. Bear in mind that's around 1.4 teflops ahead of the current generation Xbox One X. Of course, there are multiple caveats there. First of all, that's only 4K 30 FPS. That's a far cry from 4K 60 FPS. And the second caveat is that is only with current generation PlayStation slash Xbox graphical fidelity. That is not with next generation in mind. So there is quite the gap there. My guess is that for a lot of console titles, we still won't be seeing full fat 4K uh, native rendering. I su suspect we're going to see a lot of upscaling. We're going to see a lot of checkerboard rendering. And from Microsoft's point of view, particularly with exclusives, that may not be a big deal. After all, they are making it rather obvious that all the titles that you want to play on the Xbox are coming to PC, at least their first party games. And from Microsoft's point of view, that doesn't matter, right? If you've got, let's say, four or $500, or you want a system for your living room, then by golly gosh, the next generation Xbox is probably for you. But if you have the desire to go with a non-compromised solution, then obviously you have the option of PC. And with PC, of course, you can do a lot of cool things. Uh, very slight aside, I recently tested out Steam Link. Actually, Amy bought one on the, on the Steam sale. She bought it for like a couple of pounds. Uh, though shipping made it like £10, I think. And we actually just tried it a couple of days ago, and it's really awesome, Steam Link. I know it sounds kind of weird that I've not used Steam Link before, but there's just not really any need with my particular setup. But yeah, we've been reviewing some hardware, and it just kind of worked out rather nicely uh, with Steam Link. So there are a lot of ways that you can stream games into your living room if you do have a high-performance PC. But not everyone wants to plonk down all of that cash for a PC, or perhaps they just 
prefer the console ecosystem, which is fair enough, and therefore Microsoft do have that sewn up with the Xbox. As for Sony, well, obviously they're on top right now with the PlayStation uh, 4, so if they can continue that with the next generation PlayStation, hmm, remains to be seen. And obviously Nintendo, well, they're Nintendo, and the Switch is just selling absolutely like crazy. In fact, a very small piece of news is Octopath Traveler, which of course is a collaborative effort between Square and uh, Nintendo. Nintendo are essentially publishing it on behalf of Square, is selling incredibly well. It's actually one of those games where I want to play it, but I just don't have the time right now. <laughs> but I'm really into old school RPGs, like turn based as a slight aside. So it looks amazing to me. So I definitely want to go ahead and pick it up at some point. So obviously Nintendo are certainly doing extremely well also. So the next couple of years, at least for console and PC gaming actually, are going to be really interesting. A slew of rumours that have popped up concerning AMD and the next generation of Ryzen processors. To clarify, these concern most likely the Zen 2 microarchitecture, so this will be Zen 7NM. And there are two reasons that these rumours are in the headlines. Uh, one rumour actually comes up from MSI of all companies, and that is from their B450 Motherboard promotional videos. They have said that they will be compatible with 8 cores and up. Of course, the fact that it's 8 cores and up is kind of a good indicator that, yeah, um... There's additional SKUs in the pipeline there. Of course, this is not exactly confirmation by itself, but before we get into the Chinese rumors, let's do a little bit of uh, digging here. So firstly, it's great news if you have a 400 series board or you're investing on a 400 series board. I'm known about the 300 series boards, but at least if you are buying or plan to buy a 400 series board, you're probably good to go. It means that the VRMs and all the other bits and pieces which mean uh, which make up a board are not going to explode if you're like, okay, well, I'm going to put in the Ryzen, I don't know what it's going to be called, 3700X? Mm. But yeah, if you plonk that in, it's most likely not going to go up in a pile of flames, which is obviously a pretty good thing. The second thing is that the wording there is once again very much in line with these rumors from the Chinese forum. Now, these rumors are not just a core count increase either. Uh, Supposedly, we'll be seeing up to 16 processor cores, 32 threads, but furthermore, a 10 to 15% IPC improvement as well. Just to clarify, IPC is not related to clock speed. It is simply the workload, in a nutshell, that a processor can complete in, an instru in one cycle, so instructions per clock. Now, if we are indeed to take these rumors at face value, and that is down to you, of course, this would be incredible. It would mean that, A, you would see a massive amount of additional threads. I mean, it's literally double the threads as what you currently have available. 16 cores, 32 threads, IKA the same number as the 1950X Threadripper, which would be nuts. I mean, I'm not gonna say that no one ever is gonna use that. Obviously, if you're a HEDT user, you can easily do that, right? If I was to say to a lot of users, here, here's double the number of cores, they're gonna find a way to use it, whether it's video editing, whether it's 3D rendering, whether it's development, whether it's whatever, you're gonna find a way to use them if you're that type of uh, individual. But for the average person, if you're gaming, if you're streaming, if you're doing whatever, that is an awful lot of processor cores. That is absolutely ridiculous. Now, from the rumors, the next generation Threadrippers, however, will stick to the same number of cores, so we're going to get uh, 32 cores, 64 threads for the Threadripper 3000 series, which of course will be on the TR4 platform. With the Epic platform, uh, it will be 64 cores and 128 threads, which is absolutely just bonkers. I mean, once again, it's server, so with HPC usage, you can use it. But still, that is an incredible value proposition. That number of CPU cores, that many threads on a single socket. And that's the thing. This is like just a single socket. 10 to 15% IPC, though, is incredible. Of course, in terms of power consumption and clock speeds, it's very difficult to know exactly. After all, while it is being manufactured on a 7NM process because of the additional processor cores, 
clock, clock frequency scaling, excuse me, is very difficult to ascertain. But according to um, TSMC themselves, we could see up to a 40% uh, device improvement in terms of performance. That's 7 nm compared to 14 nm, and total power reduction is 60% uh, lower from 14 nm down to 7 nm. Even if we're somewhat conservative with the clock speed of 7nm Zen 2, let's say that it's 4.5, 4.6 gigahertz, which I do feel is quite doable, that would still be absolutely incredible. That number of processor cores, that clock speed, my only concern actually lies within memory bandwidth and core latency. It's possible that we might see higher memory bandwidth with improved memory uh, controller support, perhaps improvements in cache, perhaps they've got larger caches, and so on, which would help to alleviate the deficit in terms of memory bandwidth. And of course, by deficit, I mean in comparison to the Threadripper X399 platform. Another possibility as well is that we will just have faster memory at that point, possibly the introduction of DDR5, although I guess it really depends on how all of the timelines align. It's very unlikely that we're gonna see DDR5 uh, mainstream at that point and that's putting it very very mildly so it's going to be very cool and there's a another question as well is there going to be a total redesign on the CCXs my gut feeling is yes there will be a very much a redesign on how AMD put together the CCXs inside these processors for those who are uninitiated currently you have uh, multiple CCXs which form the Threadripper or even let's say the 2700 each CCX has four processor cores, and of course, they also have things like level three cache, level two cache, and all of the other bits and pieces which come together to form the whole. It's possible we may see this number increased. So for example, a CCX might have six CPU cores, or it could have eight CPU cores, or whatever number. If that's the case, then obviously you have yield improvements as well because it allows AMD to do things like, I don't know, release a 10 core processor. Let's say you have a six, two six, uh, six core CCXs and a couple of those cores are defective. Well, then they can simply rebadge it and sell it as like a, I don't know, a 3600X, I'm assuming. AMD have gone on record and said that they want to bring disruptive bandwidth to the market, which we can presume is going to be additional PCIe bandwidth. Um, it's going to assume PCIe 4. I don't think they're going to have 5 to the market by the time Zen 2 rolls around. And if they can increase the bandwidth across the chips, as I just mentioned, it may help to alleviate the fact it doesn't have quad channel memory uh, like the X399 platform and is making do with dual channel. I don't think that uh, simply because obviously with the backwards compatibility with the 400 boards, I don't think that we're going to see uh, quad channel or tri-channel memory or anything like that with these uh, particular processors. Uh, because it would really kind of eat into the Threadripper parts, but we'll just have to wait and see. And finally, we're going to finish the video off with a Z390 motherboard, which of course is from Intel's upcoming chipset, which has appeared on Sysoft Sandra. The motherboard is an Asus TUF Z390 Pro, and it is running at the moment anyway with an i7-8700K, so it is not the so-called ninth generation processors. So whether we're gonna see the Z390 motherboards launch with the eight core processors is still unknown. I'd really hope yes. But of course, as I mentioned in a, a couple of videos ago, one of the leading rumors with the ninth core processors and the one that's really making me more excited about it more than anything else is that supposedly these processors will be soldered, which would mean that at least in theory, we should be able to see at least two or three or even 400 megahertz on average higher overclocks, which would be absolutely amazing for folks who do like to uh, get the most out of their system. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. But yeah, bye for now.